Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. So today we have Dr. Hugh Kraft. So I'll give you a statistic. If I said to you, Dr. Kraft is number one at Corellius, could mean many things. What do you think it actually means today? Anybody? His patients might say He's that. The longest serving pediatric faculty member. Well, Marcia came back though, so I, I don't know. It, it depends on how you count it. <laughs> some, some, uh, consecutive. Okay, consecutive. Yeah, okay. The longest serving consecutive pediatric faculty member. Uh, so he is number one still. And Dr. Keyes is trying to catch up. Um, Dr. Kraft completed his, he's a graduate of UNC for both his undergraduate pediatric residency and a master's in public health. He went on to Duke University Medical Center to complete a fellowship in neonatology. He came to the Roanoke Valley in 1985 and worked as everything, a neonatologist, a pediatric intensivist, a hospitalist, and a general pediatrician. He recently completed a postgraduate history of medicine program from Johns Hopkins University, and he precepts the history of medicine elective and VTC SOM currently. He serves on Corellian's Corellian Clinic's Ethics Committee, committee many keys, and consult services. His interests include the history of medicine, bioethics, and spending time outside away from medicine. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hugh Kraft. I guess there are different ways to be number one. Now, this, this one isn't too bad. It means you're still around. So, um, well, uh, good morning, everybody. When I when I do grand rounds, it's almost always something related to history. Because I think you, you get more interested in history as you get a little older. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is uh, kind of the evolution of medical ethics. And who in the room has heard of Hippocrates? Raise your hand. <laughs> Uh, who in the room has heard of Henry Beecher? Dr. Gay has, because I, I prepped him on one of our dog walks a couple of weeks ago. So. <laughs> I, I titled this because you know, we all know who Hippocrates is, but I, almost no one knows who Henry Beecher is. And, and he, at least in you know, relatively mo the, re the relatively modern evolution of medical ethics, he, he is a, he's a pivotal figure. And so we will get to him at some point a little bit later. Uh, no disclosures, uh, one disclaimer. Uh, this presentation is necessarily incomplete reporting of how medical ethics developed and evolved over more than 2,000 years, but attempts to present uh, some of the key milestones and developments. Uh, who was Hippocrates? Well, there are lots of busts and images of him, but we really don't know what he looked like. Um, he was born around 460 BC on an island, that kind of one of the Greek islands. Uh, he was born into a medical family. And he taught and practiced medicine. He was kind of the first dual threat. He had a, he had a, he had a medical school, and he had a, had a, a vigorous medical practice. And, and he died somewhere around 370 BC. And his legacy is there, there are over 60 ancient texts that are devoted to the philosophy and practice of medicine that, that are credited to him in some way. And if you think about that, there are not many people that have any texts that have survived that long that are really credited to them. Um, the majority of the texts date, though, to, to really tie out the time after he, he died, and, and uh, it's suspected that the you know, students and, and uh, individuals that worked with him copied these, edited them, modified them, and that's why that's how they survived. Um, and first-hand accounts of his life and his work, are, they're really completely lacking. Um, so, so that's what we know about him. Um, and then the Hippocratic texts or corpus, uh, if you haven't gotten into these, the, the reading is, you know, it's a little challenging because uh, the syntax and Things is just you know it, it's it was written in Greek originally so it's been translated and retranslated multiple times, but it's fascinating to read some of these things just to see what kind of things you know physicians at this time were interested in and what they could notice and record and make note of and so there are books on prognosis on regimen uh, the the airs waters and places text that that's the first text on 
the effects of the environment on health. Uh, and it's fascinating to go back and read, you know, what you know, they, they were putting two and two together. If you lived in swampy places, you were more likely to get sick with certain things, even though they really didn't know what the cause of the sicknesses were. Um, <coughs> on the sacred disease is actually a treatise on epilepsy. Um, which um, was thought to be due to a uh, patient being possessed, and the, the writer of this argued that it was not. It was actually due to some derangement in physiology. Um, and then there, there are a couple of texts on the epidemics. Uh, there's a, a kind of an early text on what you need to do to stay healthy, <laughs> a regimen for health. Uh, the aphorisms are fascinating to read. They're, they're uh, 60, 70, 80, 100, just, you know, one-liners on, on practicing medicine or things you need to do to stay healthy. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the things ancient physicians could do was deal with fractures. There, you know, surgery was not really being performed at this time, but they could, you know, attempt to set fractures, and so there's actually a treatise on fractures. And then there, there's several texts on how do doctors should behave. Precepts, art, decorum, physician, and and the oath, which we you know, um, the oath is still recited. Uh, most white coat ceremonies recite the oath, and uh, I think it's still recited at graduation. Um, the first statements regarding the duties of a physician in any of these texts are found in the Book of Epidemics. One. And, and it's really interesting to read these, declare the past, diagnose the present, foretell the future, as to diseases make a habit of two things, to help the patient and not to harm. And that's where that, you know, that, that you know, we, we, the, a doctor's primary <coughs> job is to help the patient and try and help them get better, but not to cause harm. And that's the origin of that statement, which has kind of been modified a little bit, but that's where it comes from. The art, of the, the art has three factors, the disease, the, the patient, and the physician. The physician is the servant of the art. The patient must cooperate with the physician in combating the disease. And, and that appears to be the earliest statement in any of the Hippocratic writings that addresses the doctor-patient relationship, which is what medical ethics is really all about. And then this, this is the original oath. Uh, it, we really don't know if Hippocrates was the author. Uh, it was written sometime in the 4th to 3rd century B.C., and, and uh, the oldest surviving fragment, you know, these things were all manuscripts written on parchment, and you know, they just didn't survive well as time passed. And so the oldest surviving fragment is about 275 A.D., so it's really, that's much later than it was actually actually written. And, and it's undergone multiple revisions, and there, there was a pretty well-known modern revision in the early 1960s, and that some modification of that is really what we use uh, when it's recited in, uh, in medical schools now. And, then, and if you jump forward a little bit, uh, Galen was a, he was a Greek physician born some years after Hippocrates, um, and it's interesting, his first job was, he was, um, he was kind of the team doctor for a, 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 a for uh, Roman legion, legionnaires who fought in, in uh, Colosseums and things like that. That was, that was kind of his first job, or early trauma surgeon, I guess. <laughs> but but he, he traveled all over, um, all over the, the Mediterranean, and uh, he, he was going to be a priest, but after his father had a dream in which Asclepius commanded uh, his son to study medicine, Galen followed his dad's advice and proceeded to become a physician. And he formulated the, the humoral theory of physiology that it, it was the basis of medical practice for a thousand years. So, I mean, think about that. I mean, we've had kind of our modern physiology for maybe 150. Well, his physiology, that, that was what doctors used for a thousand years. And, uh, and when it was finally overturned, it, it, it didn't go quietly because it was so embedded in medical practice. Um, uh, he finally settled in Rome, and he was actually, he was a physician to several emperors, uh, and, and it was a very prolific writer, and, and more of his texts survived from antiquity than any other writer in, in, in any capacity. So if you go back and look at ancient texts from this period, more of Galen's texts survived than any, any other person, which is pretty remarkable. And I think tells you, you know, how important medical texts were. 
And how, how were medical texts created at this time? It was all, it was all transcribed by hand on parchment. I, this was before the printing press. So I mean, the, the ability to kind of keep these things alive and reproduced, it was very tedious. And, you know, libraries caught fire and everything burned up. So, you know, just the, the fact that this many texts survived of his is, is pretty remarkable. Um, and, and he was a vigorous supporter and, and wrote a lot about Hippocratic principles in his writings. Um, and, and these are some of the things, so, some statements from some of his writings. Any physician worth his, the name of the honorable, uh, name made honorable by Hippocrates must know all parts of philosophy, the logical, the physical, and the ethical. Uh, and that, that was from the best doctor is also a philosopher. And, and philosophy and medicine were tied together uh, as kind of learned activities for a very long time. One, one should look for a learned physician, a perennial student, a man of very regular life. And you know, back then, all physicians were men. Uh, and that was from examining the best physician. He had a little handbook on what patients should do to try and select a physician. Uh, and, and Galen's writings express the importance of attitudes, virtues of the good physician. Uh, and, and the image he painted of the good physician, I mean, like his physiology, it, it lingered and, and was kind of embedded in medicine for, for literally hundreds of years. Um, I put this in because it's important to appreciate that most, at most, much of medical care during this time and even the centuries after were, were, were not, was not by, provided by physicians. It was provided by other healers, and you know, they have all sorts of names, herbalists, faith healers, midwives, uh, quacks came into the lexicon fairly early, but, but m m most people who got sick were not seen by a physician. They were seen by a local healer of some type. Um, and really what we know, and, and these local healers left essentially no written record. So we really don't know what was going on in that aspect of healing. Um, and, and these healers would have little or no exposure to Hippocratic principles. Uh, they, they would have, it would be more of an oral tradition passed down uh, from, from person to person. Uh, and it's also interesting that the classical literature has very few references to the Hippocratic Oath. Um, I'll, I'll touch more on that a little bit later. Um, post Galen, the Roman Empire fell. Um, you know, it was kind of chaos in Europe, and literate medicine just kind of it kind of ceased to exist because the institutions ceased to exist. And then in, in the fourth century, Saint Basil founded a Christian monastery in Cappadocia, and it included what was, what was really the first Christian hospital. Uh, so hospitals actually have a fairly lengthy history. And, and this was kind of the beginning of organized medicine, and it organized in monasteries. And uh, why, why did it organize in monasteries? Anybody have any idea why it happened there? It's where all the books were. All the, all the manuscripts were in the monasteries because one of the things monks did was recopy manuscripts. So all, all the medical texts were in primarily in monasteries. So that's kind of why monasteries developed into the first universities. Because that, that's, that's where, that's where the, the books of knowledge were. And the church during this time viewed rational medicine favorably and following naturally from Jesus' teachings and, and as a way to counter magic and superstition. You know, the physicians were acting kind of by the grace and with the knowledge of God. This was a way to counteract other modes of healing which the church didn't view as... Uh, and, and acceptable. And then, and then as, as we come on, I'm, I'm going to come through and talk about, you know, you know, some figures that we actually can find some statements, you know, that they left that, you know, relate to how physicians should act and care for their patients and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and act within their profession. And, and uh, St. Basil is, he, he, he was, Helped found the first that monastery in the first first one of the first hospitals and, and said that we must take great care to employ the medical art if it should be necessary we should neither repudiate this art altogether nor does it behoove us to repose all our confidence in it when reason allows we can call on the doctor but we do not to leave off hoping for God and and that and religion and healing were very closely tied for 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 uh, hundreds of years. Uh, 
and uh, really didn't start to diverge until scientific medicine began to come on the scene. And then, and then a little bit later, uh, Cassiodorus was, he was actually a pretty prominent statesman and scholar in Rome, but actually became, uh, well, went into a religious order. Um, and uh, he prepared instructions for the care of the sick, including a bibliography of the important medical texts that monastic physicians should study. And, and really, a lot, of, a lot of the first learned physicians who actually had studied the old texts they were they were monks who they they were living and, and working in monasteries and that that's why monasteries became kind of the first hospitals and the first universities it's very hard if you go through ancient texts and sources to to find much about women um but one woman who there is actually a fair bit of uh, information on is, is, is hildegard of Bingen. and and there, there's actually a fair bit of uh, uh, in the text world about her, um, and um, she um, she was a very well known herbalist and and com compiled a very large compendium of herbal remedies. Uh, and you know this was all this is before antibiotics and any of the stuff we use now. And herbal remedies had a had a very important place in the practice of medicine for thousands of years, and and still does does to some degree. But, but if you look at the Hippocratic influence during this time, the, the manuscripts, they, they contain references to the principles, but they don't really talk about the oath in its entirety to any significant degree. But they talk about you know, general things about physicians. They should be studious of good moral character, cheerful, clean, gracious, reliable, and humble. Uh, the, physician, the physician should not heal for the sake of gain nor give more consideration to the rich than to the poor. And that, that's a very common theme throughout the ancient writings. And it was around this time that a, that a Christianized version of the oath, kind of, kind of the first update, appeared. And then after the fall of Rome and kind of chaos in Europe, a new religion sprung up in Arabia, and, and th this had a very profound effect on, on Western medicine. Uh, with the rise of, of Islam uh, and Muhammad, uh, Baghdad became a, a, a very rich center of Islamic scholarship, and th there wasn't much scholarship going on in Europe at this time. Uh, it was still kind of the dark ages and just not, you know, institutions had kind of disintegrated and had not kind of come back yet. And, and this is important for a couple reasons. The, the, um, the Islamic movement, they founded a number of hospitals and more and closer to what we would think of as a, as a modern hospital, uh, not like our hospitals, but kind of closer in concept. <clears throat> And, and another thing they did is they, uh, any kind of manuscript they could find related to medicine, they translated it into Arabic. And, and as it turned out over time, a lot of the, a lot of the original transcripts in Greek, that they were just lost to time. The, you know, uh, the, big Ale the big library in Alexandria burned, there were like tens of thousands of manuscripts there. So a, a lot of the Greek manuscripts got preserved because they were translated into Arabic, and then subsequently were, re, were discovered later and then retranslated back into to Greek and Latin. But that translation movement by Islamic physicians was very important in preserving a lot of the ancient writings. Um, and um, they, the Islamic physicians studied these and wrote a lot about them. Uh, and th th this was a period of scholarship that lasted uh, hundreds of years, and, and you can go through and find <laughs> some Islamic physicians who, who uh, you know, wrote, uh, wrote uh, uh, treatises and, uh, and texts on, on uh, medical ethics. This, this is Ali Rahawi, and he, he wrote an early Islamic text that was devoted to medical ethics and outlined the, the traits of the virtuous physician. Uh, mercy, conscientious attention, patience, firmness, chaste, keep secrets, bestow the benefits of science on all people without distinguishing them as friend or foe. Use justice with the poor and weak so that they may benefit from the medical art. And, and you begin to see some of the things that I think still, you know, influence the way we approach patient care in, you know, in writings that are a thousand years old. And, and of, of the Islamic physicians, uh, 
Avicenna is, he, he, he kind of stands a little bit apart from the rest, but because of the volume of translations that he did, and he also wrote, you know, they would translate these texts, and then they would kind of go through and kind of update them based on what, how they saw medicine or what had been learned, perhaps, since the time that it was originally written. And he wrote a very lengthy text of medicine called the Canon, and it was the authoritative medical text, even in European universities, once they began to reconstitute. So, so he had a very profound sense of the facts of medicine. Yeah, I'm sorry, Judge Floyd, I think And then if we move on to the Middle Ages, due to the influences of Judaism and Christianity and Islam, religion played, it really played the dominant role in the maintenance of literate medicine from the fall of the Roman Empire to the Renaissance. And that was because, you know, the books were in religious institutions where they were translated, copied, and studied and commented on. And so that's where all the scholarship related to medicine was taking place. And medical education began very slowly to become more formalized because within these religious institutions began to form the earliest universities. And so that's really the origins of the universities that eventually became the first medical schools. And this is referred to as kind of learned medicine. So these were physicians and students who would go study with professors in these universities. And medicine kind of joined theology and law in the early university as the third profession. And to become a learned physician, university training became the standard. Hippocrates, Galen, and Avicenna were the key sources of authority. But meanwhile, you know, if you went out, you know, away from the universities, small towns, communities, settlements, you know, the local healers were still providing most of the medical care. And those providers, there's just no written record on them. So we really don't know what was going on. We can guess, but we really don't know. And yeah, it's interesting that the oath is not that references to and even discussions of the entire oath, they're just really lacking in the historical record, you know, really for almost a thousand years. But the first aphorism of Hippocrates comes up over and over again. And it says a lot. Life is short. The art is long. Opportunity fleeting. Experiment treacherous. Judgment difficult. The physician must be ready not only to do his duty himself, but also to secure the cooperation of the patient and the attendants and of the externals. And there are lots of commentaries on this aphorism throughout the ancient writings. And there's a lot there that I think kind of reflects things that we still have to take into account. We might not phrase it quite the same way now, but I think that aphorism still reflects some of the things that we do in modern time. Now, as the kind of Middle Ages ended, physicians started to kind of form groups, guilds, and these are kind of like the first medical societies. And guilds have been formed for trades and crafts. But the early physicians started to think, well, maybe it would be a good idea if we kind of bonded together. Most of these had a religious aspect. Most of them had some standards that were put forth for moral behavior of physicians. Surgeons and barbers were kind of, they were kind of below, they were kind of a tier or two below learned physicians. So they were the first to kind of get organized. Why were barbers in with surgeons? Anybody know? Well, barbers were the ones you'd go to, like if you needed something lanced or if you needed to get bled, you would go to the barber because they had all the sharp things. And so they would bleed you or they would lance something. So they were, 
uh, you know, but that, that was kind of below the learned physicians. Um, that, that was something he just didn't really want to get into. They, the, the barbers and the surgeons for years were, they were kind of a tier or two below the, the university trained physicians who had studied the ancient manuscripts and, you know, didn't, didn't uh, go down to the level of actually, you know, doing something like that to a patient. So, um, a fa fascinating time. But they were the first ones to organize. And the primary motivation was setting standards and promoting physicians' interests. So, no surprise there. Um, but they also provided services to their localities. And, um, but in return, they would want the locality to kind of grant them monopoly and prestige for being, you know, kind of having ex exclusivity for delivering medical care. So, human nature at work. And this, this guy, the Shiliaka, he, he was actually a really well-known surgeon in southern France. And he kind of, uh, he might see Savison's big textbook of surgery when they were in medical school. Yeah. He, he kind of was the, he wrote the first Savison's. He kind of wrote the first definitive surgical text. Um, and, and he was interested in how physicians you know, should behave. The doctor should be well-mannered, bold yet cautious, should abhor false cures and practices, <clears throat> affable to the sick, kind-hearted to his colleagues, wise in prognostications. He should be chaste, sober, compassionate, merciful. He should not be covetous, grasping in monetary matters. And then he will receive a fee commensurate to, with his labors and the financial ability of his patients the success of his treatment and his own dignity. And he, he actually, he was an early writer, even though he wrote a big surgical text, he wrote a fair bit about how you should behave towards patients. And, and he was a physician, he was a physician surgeon to three popes, so he must have been pretty well thought of. Now, it was around this time that the first waves of the Black Death started to sweep across Europe. Um, I actually talked about this a couple of years ago. Where, 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 where did plague originate? You might remember where it kind of came, started and kind of how it got to Europe. St started in the Black Sea ports, where uh, actually traders from Italy had uh, had connections there with some of the some of the uh, places they could secure things in in Central Central Asia. Um, and so ships from there actually they, they, it first it first appeared in Messina and then spread spread into Italy and, and eventually all over Europe. Their tales of a ship a ship would come into Messina and only three sailors would still be alive and and they, they wouldn't let them get off the ship. I mean they, if they tried to get off the ship they they'd kill them because they they were I mean, it, that, that, that's that's what it was like back then. There was no treatment. Nobody really knew what caused it. They knew if you got close to somebody, you might get it and die. So it was just a very different time. And it, it actually provoked kind of a moral crisis among, among physicians because um, they, um, you know, should we hang around and try and help or should we escape and survive so we can come back and help? And so it was, this was kind of a first big moral crisis that physicians and uh, you know one physician wrote leave fast go far return slowly um, and, uh, but a lot of physicians did stay and 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 die and, and plague was and you know plague was deadly you know, um, it was just deadly uh, kind of in a way we really can't comprehend um, uh, moving up the law, kind of renaissance to the enlightenment. Learned medicine is kind of firmly situated in universities, and humanism, kind of the ancient Greek and and uh, you know writings from antiquity, were slowly rediscovered. A lot of them in a lot of them in Arabic translation that they were they were, they were then retranslated into Latin. And then the printing press came along in 1440. And then you know, once that happened, you know it's kind of like the internet for us. I mean, previously, you know, medical texts are like copied by hand, you know, monks in monasteries, and then all of a sudden you can start printing multiple copies of these things. And so the, the availability of information really picked up. Um, and writings from this period, period emphasize the importance of education and confidence, physicians being educated and trained and, and knowledgeable about their profession. There are also changes in compensation. Uh, 
for a long time you would kind of get an honorarium depending on how you did uh, with your uh, care. And more physicians, particularly that worked in cities and towns, began to, to lobby for a salary. So we're seeing here a little, ch a little change in how medicines are, uh, or how medicine was compensated. And it was also during this time that there, there began to be a lot of theological work related to, uh, to medicine. Uh, you know, medicine and faith still very tightly uh, connected. Uh, Catholics and theologians uh, start, developed a way to, anal to analyze cases of, of illness related to moral questions. It's, it's the first appearance of the terms ordinary and extraordinary, which, you know, we still use those today. Um, and uh, th those first appeared then. And then, then uh, St. Thomas formulated the concept of the double effect. Anybody know, anybody know what the double effect is? <laughs> That's where you, 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 with some action, you accomplish a good, but you also accomplish something bad. And, I, and a, a really modern clinical example is a, a mother who has twins, and if you don't do anything, both will die. If you selectively terminate one twin, that the, 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 well, one twin will survive and be healthy. The, the, the other twin will be kind of, will do sacrifice. But, and, and, and this is the, kind of the doctrine, too, of, you know, it, it's okay to kill somebody if they're trying to kill you. you know? um, so th these are the kind of things that Catholic theologians spend a lot of time, uh, a lot of time thinking about. But th but a lot of this work was not. You know, this was pre Gutenberg, so a lot of this didn't really circulate until after the printing press was invented. And then if you go through, I'm gonna quickly go through. There there, there are three or four um, <coughs> physicians that you know during. During kind of leading up to the to the Renaissance and uh, more modern period, they, they wrote little texts or booklets on um, you know how doctors should behave. So you kind of begin to see the little hint of more kind of a modern code of medical ethics. So uh, you know, uh, Deserbi was a professor of medicine in Padua, and that that was a prominent university in Italy, and you know described physicians as educated upper middle or upper class. Primary obligation is to earn the trust of the patient. The central virtue is fidelity. Uh, patient is the faithful <laughs> companion of the body of his patient. Suffers with him, rejoices in his health. You're kind of getting the religious kind of kind of flavor to this too. Physician is like a priest to whom God has revealed the divine powers of healing, and to whom people revert, reveal their souls for the cure of their bodies. And, and he, this is really the very first kind of systematic, you know. Uh, discourse uh, outline of, 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 you know, kind of a modern medical ethics. And then there's some other physicians kind of scattered through Europe who kind of did the same thing. You know, um, uh, a lot of their writings were, were uh, included things about how doctors should behave, both within the profession and, and towards their patients. Um, they, Bottom line, they should serve, serve all who seek their help, even enemies, the poor, or the ungrateful, and should never undertake to cure the incurable. Which kind of has a little bit of a modern ring now, so we kind of struggle with, uh, you know, care, uh, futility, and that whole concept. And then this is Frederick Hoffman who uh, Wrote, you know, here we're getting getting kind of into the modern period. But I like the third one in particular. The physician should not be timid with important persons, but should make pre, not make pretenses of curing the incurable. Keep this rule above all when treating princes. So, and, and a lot of these physicians actually served at court, or so you know, served in places where they were taking care of a lot of important, well-educated people. <coughs> Now, I want to just touch on this. Uh, Johann Peter Frank, this is not ethics in, as such, but he, he was kind of the first physician to um, kind of write about, you know, more of a kind of a social public health approach to medicine. And he had served as a country doctor, a local health officer, a professor at five universities, and a, and a CMO of the largest hospital in Vienna. So he had... He was very well trained. And, and he wrote a six-volume 
kind of treatise on, you know, kind of, it was, it, it's the first treatise on community health and, you know, the, the physician's role in, in promoting and maintaining the health of the entire community. Uh, all right, let's move on now to, we're going to, we're going to, we're getting mostly in Europe where there, there were things going on in England, but I, I want to touch on as we're getting a little closer to the modern period. Uh, during the mid, early to mid 18th century, so 1700s, uh, a lot of wealthy individuals, kind of like now, they, they began to found hospitals. They call them infirmaries. Uh, and in England, 17 of these appeared during the 18th century. And uh, like today, there were frequently disputes that came up regarding appointment of physicians and surgeons to the staff, uh, professional background, religion was still a factor, politics was a factor. Uh, and they had a kind of a huge row at the Manchester Infirmary about this in 1791. And so the governors at the infirmary appointed Thomas Percival, who he was kind of the leading doctor in the community. I mean, if you would look in pediatrics, he was kind of like the Doug Pierce of, you know, pediatrics. But he was like the Doug Pierce of the entire medical community at this time. So they, um, they asked him to prepare a scheme of professional conduct related to hospitals and medical, other medical charities. So he went to work. Um, he was well-educated. Even at this time, most British physicians had studied in Europe across, across the channel. And, and he was a, a fellow of the Royal Society. And the, the APS is the American Philosophical Society. He was actually, he had pretty tight connections with, uh, with kind of early America. Uh, in fact, had Ben Franklin uh, stayed with him uh, during one of his visits there. Uh, and he was also interested in public health and occupational health. So he, he, he was not just, uh, just interested in medicine at the patient level. And he... Um, he wrote a very influential uh, meta, uh, textbook. It was it, at first it was a pamphlet, but it got expanded into a textbook. And um, uh, and he was the first one to use medical ethics in kind of the context of related to patient care. Uh, and it came out in kind of short form in, in 1792, and then a full book in 1803. Um, and um, in it, he noted physicians acquired duties of office granted to them by society. Physicians and surgeons should never forget that their professions are public trusts. And it's really interesting. His, his book helped solve the problems at the infirmary, but it didn't really gain widespread credence in England. Um, and, uh, and the reasons for that, I don't really know. Uh, but th this was kind of the first modern textbook of medical ethics. Um, and then across the pond, um, you know, America was still, we're still kind of rough and ready in the early, you know, late 18th, early 19th century. Very young country. And, you know, most medical care was out in the, you know, it was out in towns and villages and, you know, whoever, whoever had a little bit of healing knowledge would, would try to apply it. Very few educated physicians, almost all those had been trained in Europe. And they were in Boston, Philadelphia, New York. Uh, and there really weren't any medical schools to speak of at this point. If you wanted to study medicine, you'd go study with a physician. But there really weren't any medical schools to speak of at this point. And Benjamin Rush is kind of considered the founder of American medicine. And he's actually the physician who signed the Declaration of Independence. Um, and, and Rush wrote a lot about medical ethics. Uh, he had, he had a, a, a broad interest in moral issues related to medicine and society. He, he had a series of essays that, uh, or a series of lectures that he gave to the University of Pennsylvania medical students that were titled The Virtues and Vices of Physicians and the Duties of Physicians and Methods of Improving Medicine. Um, and, and, you know, talked about in general terms, you know, physicians should, uh, uh, you still see the tie with religion very close to the religion, return, attend divine services, be composed, punctual, reasonable, and should not abandon patients whose conditions seem desperate. So you're kind of beginning to see kind of a little bit of flavor of how American medical ethics was going to develop. Uh, 
And, and medicine in this country as, as kind of the mid 19th century approach, uh, they went from a few medical schools at, you know, Penn and Harvard and Yale to like over 80 as kind of the Civil War approach. And, you know, there was no, you know, double AMC or, I mean, if somebody wants to start medical school, they just kind of, you know, put up a bill somewhere and tell us what tuition was and people just kind of come and start going to medical school. That was kind of the way it was. There was no, there was no, there was no MCAT. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure you didn't have to write an essay to get, to get into medical school. Uh, so we went from no schools almost to uh, this huge number of schools. And, and alternative healing during the first half of the 19th century, it was like rocking and rolling. Uh, homeopathy, hydropathy, botanical healing. There was a, a big group related to Samuel Thompson, Thompsonian healing spiritual and faith healing, and, and these were referred to by physicians as irregular practitioners. So you, you hear that term a lot in the 19th century. Uh, by mid-centuries, uh, most states, kind of, you know, by the first third of the 19th century, had state licensing requirements, and by mid-century, they all had repealed them. So it was kind of chaos. I mean, anybody could do anything, you know, anything they wanted to. And so um, Nathan, Nathan Smith Davis proposed, he, he, lived, he practiced in New York, he proposed that to the New York Medical Society that they reinstate medical licensing and start a standard medical school curriculum. Uh, and those were adopted, and they actually had a national convention to address this in 1847. Uh, and this, anybody know what this gave rise to? What, what did this give rise to? What organization did this give rise to eventually? This day of that, this, this, this beginning of the American Medical Association. Um, and they wrote a code of ethics at that meeting, and it drew heavily on Percival. Percival had much more influence here than in, in England and Europe. Uh, and it, uh, it outlined the duties of physicians and patients, the duties of physicians to each other in the profession, and the duties of the public to and obligations of the public to the profession. <laughs> so, and it, it's really interesting to read, read this. And, and you, you have to get your, try and get yourself in the mind of the time, because we read it and kind of go, you know, <coughs> seems crazy. But, you know, it, it, it was a very different time. And the world was kind of understood in a different way. Um, but but one, one thing I took from, from it was a physician should be ever ready to obey the calls of the sick. So we, we do see in this uh, kind of the ethic of the physician, you know, attending to the sick when he is called to do so. Um, and then uh, uh, Worthington Hooker, was a, he was a very noted professor at Yale. And, and um, he actually, he commented a lot on, um, on the AMA uh, code of ethics, and and you know we begin to see here kind of a, a flavor of what um you know what how should how should educated physicians behave in relation to <coughs> patients and to themselves, and we start to see you know the word science coming in that you know science understanding science knowledge of science should should play a role in how physicians uh, approach patient care. And I put this in because th this was really a kind of a momentous event. Uh, it, this wasn't the first use of anesthesia in America. It actually was a few months earlier in Georgia, but it just, that, that episode just did not get the publicity that this did. But th this was the first use of anesthesia to perform a surgical procedure. Um, and and this, this caused a huge ethical debate early on because... At, at this point, that there was significant feeling that pain played some role in your ability to survive and get better, uh, which, you know, seems completely crazy now. But that was kind of the way the world was viewed back then. So surgery was not adopted, uh, anesthesia was not adopted quickly because... And it was not safe, so the sur completely so the surgeons had to balance like, well, more, how likely is the patient going to die from the anesthesia versus, you know, 
experience relief of pain and do okay if we use anesthesia. So, but the, the, this was a huge moral ethical issue when anesthesia first came out because of those factors. Um, and then uh, moving a little bit along, this, this is um, Austin Flint. I, I forgot. You might remember what his murmur is. He has a murmur. He has a murmur. Is, is it mitral stenosis? Uh, or, huh? It's when you have aortic insufficiency and it hits the mitral valve, and then you get a, a flow murmur across the mitral valve okay. because I, mean, I guess I mean, it's like relative mitral yeah. stenosis. Well, he has a murmur named mitral. after him, but he, he also he was one of the founders of the AMA. And, uh, and wrote a lot about the duties kind of kind of a, of a physician. Uh, duties applied to medicine constitutes a distinct branch of ethical science. So we kind of started to see ethics become a thing in medicine. Rules of conduct with patients, including discretion, confidentiality, and charity. Uh, strong emphasis on professional unity and, and, and public welfare. Um, and, um, but there were ethical issues within the AMA because the AMA was it was a white guys organization, um, and um, physicians of color were excluded, and um, and women were discouraged from going into medicine. And I put this in because because uh, physicians of color were excluded from the AMA, they formed their own organization. And this, this, this is C.D. Roman, who was the first president of the um, National Medical Association, um, which um, still exists today. And you can see it, bring, it, it brought in uh, medicine, surgery, pharmacy, and dentistry. So it kind of was a broad umbrella. It was actually interesting, an early proponent of national health insurance. And from what I can tell, I, I, I didn't look deeply, but I, I think they kind of adopted the AMA code of ethics. I could not find a separate code of ethics that they themselves had come up with. And then the American Medical Women's Association was founded in the uh, early 20th century. Uh, Bertha Van Hoosen, and she, she, I knew nothing about her, but she was pretty remarkable. Uh, she grew up on a farm. She went to the University of Michigan. Uh, she enrolled in the medical school. Her parents wouldn't pay her tuition, so she, because they didn't think she should be a doctor, so she worked as an OB nurse, an anatomy teacher, and, and a school teacher to pay her way through medical school. And she went on to become a very distinguished UIN surgeon. Uh, and her autobiography, Petticoat Surgeon, is still available on Amazon. So, um, interesting, 100 years out, still get that. Now, well, what's remarkable about the picture? That's her in the operating theater. <laughs> no. No masks. <laughs> yeah, there are no women in the audience. Okay. She's not wearing gloves. <laughs> She's not wearing a mask. <laughs> I mean, it just shows you that uh, you know, a a asepsis in surgery was still kind of slow. To come along. I think this is probably early, early 20th century, but uh, that, 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 that's a pretty, pretty interesting picture, I think. Uh, but she had, she had a very remarkable career as a as a GYN surgeon, and um, she's uh, operated on the wrong side of the patient too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I I put this in. Um, I, I, it's hard to talk about ethics and not mention Osler, but you know, it's interesting. Osler didn't write a lot about ethics. Um, he, he wrote um, a lot about being physicians being a good role model, and that was kind of his way uh, that you know, we should be, our ethics should come from how we behave. Um, and so as the 20th century dawned, um, medicine, it, it really was, you'd call it beneficent paternalism. The AMA had its code, um, they were dealing with kind of all these irregular practitioners, but you know, late 1800s, early 20th century, uh, germ fit theory of disease, early antibiotics, drinking and x-rays, there's starting to be more science that influences medicine. And we actually can do things for patients. I mean, you know, really up until anesthesia for surgery, there just wasn't a lot doctors did for patients that actually helped, except maybe sitting by the bedside and providing, you know, 
moral and spiritual support. Uh, and also during this time, medicine was moving increasingly from the doctor's office or the patient's home into the hospital. Uh, if you haven't read much on Richard Cabot, remarkable guy, um, he inaugurated the CPC at Mass General, which is the CPC in the New England Journal of Medicine. So he, he is directly responsible for that. He published a large series of cases of autopsies versus pre-mortem exams that demonstrated that about 30% of the time the doctors were wrong. Um, that was not received well for a while. <laughs> Um, he emphasized the importance of history, exam, and testing, because there was starting to be testing that could be done. Uh, he was an early proponent of work rules, you know, of how many patients a, a house officer should have to take care of. Uh, and he established the first school of social work, the first department of social work at Mass General, and he paid for it because the hospital wouldn't pay for it. So he's really considered the father of medical social work. Uh, and, and he wrote a lot about, about kind of how, how, well, how we should approach patients um, and um, talked a lot about the human side of practice, ordinarily left out of medical education, treating human beings as if possessed by mind, affections, talents, vices, habits, good and bad, as well as more or less diseased organs. Uh, it, it, his writings are really worth uh, visiting if you're kind of interested in exploring this a little bit. And he was a very early proponent of telling the truth, that you should tell the patient what you really think is going on. Uh, and I'll come back to that. Um, and then kind of moving into the 20th century, I, I came across this quote because it, uh, Dr. Leak was actually a PhD medical, he was kind of like the curriculum guy in medical school, but he wrote a lot about, wrote and thought a lot about medical ethics. And if you read this quote, it's like it could have been written like 10 years ago, um, uh, talking about how uh, when it becomes financially more interesting to keep his patients well than to treat them when they are sick, the fundamental idealism of the medical profession will have a better chance to express itself, and the hedonistic consequences of the present financial system will not be so likely to follow. And that was written in 1928. <laughs> um, with all the increasing scientific discoveries, um, the imperative came along, well, how do we figure out safely if these things work? And actually, Osler commented on this very early <laughs> in the 20th century. Um, and um, it, I'm fast, I just kind of ran across that quote, but he talks about that, you know, unless the patient is fully informed about what's going on, we've kind of trapped transgressed a point where the, the, the bond, the sacred bond between the physician and the patient snaps. Uh, individual, risk to individuals should be maybe taken with the, his or her consent and full knowledge of the circumstances. And that was year, that was to come years later after he said that. And then post-World War II, um, the Nuremberg trials of the of the Nazi physicians who had engaged in, in the horrific experiments during World War II. The, the Nuremberg Code was formulated, and this this was really the first document that that outlined kind of how how should clinical investigation involving human subjects be performed. And I'm not going to go through the, the full thing, but the the first point is that. It, consent, consent needs to be to, to be voluntary. The, the, the subject needs to to voluntarily consent to have, to having something performed on them. But that that's worth a read, and that that that's a foundational document for for kind of research ethics. But it really didn't have much impact for over 20 years, which is kind of interesting. And then in 1948, the first randomized clinical trial was published, and that was published in England. Um, and looked at the effect of streptomycin to treat tuberculosis. So kind of the, the, the birth of that met research methodology, methodology was uh, right after World War II. All right, we're getting to the mid-60s. We're, get, we're getting to Henry Beecher. Uh, Beecher was an anesthesiologist. He served in World War II. He had first-line experience seeing suffering and death, uh, triaging soldiers on the front lines. 
and he became very interested in research post World War II. He published a paper in 1966 which detailed 22 studies. They wouldn't let him put all 50 in there because it was too long, but which he identified informed consent was either insufficient or completely lacking. And, and to give you a couple of examples, one of these was like patients were having a bronchoscopy. Well, we'll just do a cardiac cath on them too while they're under anesthesia for their bronchoscopy. Uh, the, the Willowbrook Hall study, children in an uh, institution for children with handicaps were direct, were uh, deliberately affected with hepatitis A virus without their parents' consent so we could see what the natural history was of hepatitis A infection. Um, not that long ago. Um, this was not very well received either. Um, and and he, he included in here, look, look at the um, look at the NIH funding in 1945 and the NIH funding 20 years later. $700,000 in 1945, $465 million in 20 years later. And, and so the research enterprise had just exploded post-World War II. Um, what study was going on at this time that Beecher was not aware of? Very important study. The, the Tuskegee syphilis study was going on at this event. It had not been outed yet. And actually, um, uh, I may talk more about that at, at, at a future talk. So, so Beecher was really not aware of this. But this did this this article did get traction. It was rejected by the by the, by JAMA, which was actually the pre preeminent journal at the time. They thought it was too controversial. Um, and then this paper was published in the early 60s, just to kind of give you a flavor of where, you know, where was medicine? And this, this Oaken was a psychiatrist, <clears throat> and he looked at, you know, when, did, what did, did, did doctors usually tell patients if they have cancer? And in 1961, the answer was no. Most doctors don't, didn't tell patients that they actually had cancer. Uh, and, and so th th this kind of, you know, was fuel to the fire, you know, we've got to get We've got to move on that, you know, the doctors are just, you know, just father figures who can kind of do whatever they want to do. Um, and, uh, anyway, um, so medicine and ethics in the 60s, a lot of advances in technology, dialysis, transplantation, chemo, ICUs, you know, medical research with human subjects really progresses. We've got <clears throat> Medicare and Medicaid, paternalism starts to kind of fall away. Questions begin to, to arise uh, as to what is extraordinary care. Lots of social, cu cultural changes during this time. And then aspect uh, uh, concerns about ethical aspects of care begin to come along. You know, essentially, Beecher also was that he was the author of the first Harvard brain death criteria document in the 1960s. So he, he, he's really a key figure in kind of not only research ethics, but clinical ethics. So um, just to end up, what, what, what do y'all, what do we use for our foundations for, for our ethics today? What kind of, what things on this list or anything not on this list? Each one of them. Yeah, I don't know about y'all. I mean, I kind of felt like in training, it was the role model kind of, you know what I mean, that our role models were kind of, I mean, I don't remember hearing about codes of ethics or anything when I was in training. Um, and it's interesting, the AMA, the AMA document, not, the 1947 document was a book, and now the AMA ethical principles, it's seven little sentences, bullet items. Um, but I think, I think all of these things do come into play, and, um, and, um, you know, you could maybe under other add medical professionalism that, that maybe professionalism has kind of become, you know, where ethics is taught and kind of you know comes out of now. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know that I, I felt like the Hippocratic Oath or any of the you know those documents. I mean, I, I think we were all aware of it, but I don't think we thought of it all that much when we're taking care of patients, except maybe the the, the key things like you know first do no harm and stuff like that. Um, so th this kind of stops in 19, the 1960s. And um, you know, I found this quote in one paper that I read to kind of wrap this up. And I, when I read this, I think it really does reflect 
particularly if you're in some aspect of medicine where you have ongoing relationships with a patient, visit to visit to visit. I think it really does kind of sum up, you know, kind of what what we do and and um and how important it is to listen. I, I think um, that 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 one kind of kind of struck me as I was kind of wrapping this up. And then uh, if you look at medical ethics, clinical ethics, research ethics, that kind of has evolved into bioethics. And uh, I'll, 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 work, I'll work on that for part two. And, and I've got two that are already interested in attending. So. <laughs> um, and those are references. I'm not going to tell them who they are. <laughs> thing one and thing two. Yeah, yeah that, that's that's. That's Lily on the left and is on the right. That, 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 they're, they're Dr. Gay's dog and my dog. <laughs> but if anybody has questions, that, that's, that's a quick tour through 2,000 years. So. <laughs> I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Kraft. That was awesome. Um, there's a book called Women in White Coats, and it, it details the like starting of women going into medicine. And it talks about the challenges they faced, where they had to train. It really talks about that journey. It's really good. I just wanted to put a plug in for that. That, that would be a great grand round. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I would be thrilled to do that. Well, but you think about it. That would be a, that would be a tremendous I, grand round. Yeah. It, it's a really good book. It's it. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. Th <laughs> thanks for mentioning that. I, I mean, I think they're all they're all sports with little aspects of yeah. just you know little historical side what side alleys you can go down with this. Yeah. Um, and it's just, it's such a broad topic and, you know, ethics has gotten to be much more complicated and much more embedded in just the day-to-day, -day, particularly in the hospital, um, than it was years ago. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try and do part two next fall, maybe. All right. Thank you so much.